Right on. I want to thank you for your patience. Thank you for in, uh, indirectly looking after my daughter this way. That's beautiful. Good to have you. Thank you for your perseverance with this session number two, as you know already. And on your outline, you are on uh, Roman numeral one in the middle of the page. Greetings that we need to finish. And then we move on into the exposition. Let's take our time for a short prayer uh, time. We lift up a few people in prayer here and see how it goes from there. Father God, we thank you for your presence within us, your compassion, and all the attributes, dear Lord, that we relate unto when we look unto your holiness, dear Lord. Thank you for letting yourself be found this way by means of the pages and the word. These are your words. They are alive. They convict us of uh, what we need to be convicted. They comfort us, and they do, Lord, encourage us also. I lift up unto you, Lord, the people that are uh, under pressure, John, uh, Germain, Joan, here with what they have been through, um, Jonathan, Debbie, with what she has been through also, a new thing unto her, Lord. Thank you for the fact that she's okay and among us this morning. I'm asking you to protect her, a lady that loves to serve you, people that loves you also. I'm asking you, Lord, to bless us this morning in our study, shorter session, yet we seek to discover more. We thank you, dear Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Beautiful. Great. Thank you so much. So we finish the greetings. Basically, last week, we barely embark into it when it says, Paul, here, an apostle of Christ, circle apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. I explained to you last week, um, Germain asked a question, and I, I needed to come across quite, uh, quite directly by explaining that there is no more apostle today. Okay? In the scriptures, you have two circles of apostles, and I would like you to make your notes concerning this. Two circles of apostle, and an apostle means this is a sent person, a sent one with the authority of the sender. And with the, the authority of the sender is the most powerful statement because what Paul says is the word of the Messiah. He was sent with the, the authority of Christ, appointed by Christ to be an apostle. And what he says is not his own interpretation of scriptures. These are the foundation of the church and the words of Christ. When we talk about the 12 apostles, just quickly, because it's off topic a little bit, we have two circles. Would you come with me without losing your place in Ephesians? Come with me in the book of Acts chapter 1. I just want to show you something. Find your book of Acts chapter 1. In the book of Acts chapter 1, the church will begin. In the book of Acts chapter 1, the church will begin. And they need to find an apostle to replace Judas Iscariot, which was not saved, the son of perdition. But they need to go back to 12 apostles. And here they lay down the prerequisites that you need to have on your resume to be an apostle. That's what we read in Acts chapter 1, verse 21. I just gave you the context right now. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that it was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So in order to be part of the twelve, you need to have undertaken the baptism of John to be with Jesus until the ascension in heaven. Paul was not one of the twelve. Because the prerequisite to be part of the twelve is extensive. You need to have undertaken the baptism of John the Baptist until his ascension. The prerequisite to be of sec on the second circle 
like Paul and Barnabas and James, it's only to have seen the resurrected Christ. You need to have seen the resurrected Christ. That's the prerequisite to be of the second circle. And Paul the Apostle did see the resurrected Christ on his way to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9. And that's why in 1 Corinthians, which I will read for you, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 1, when Paul defends his apostleship, when Paul defends his apostleship, look at what he says. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? And he said, right after that, Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And you are, not, are you not my work in the Lord? So that's why he states, Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? So if you ask yourself, When did he see Christ? Uh, Paul the apostle, He saw Christ on his way to Damascus here. Okay? And I left you with willingly or unwillingly, Paul could not ex ex escape the responsibility to preach the gospel, to preach the gospel of grace. For to him it was a stewardship entrusted to him because he received very much revelation. Is that where we left last week? Yes. Good. Okay. Now we go back in the book of Ephesians. We carry on the exposition. I think now it's going to be new to you. When it says to the saints here, who are at Ephesus, I told you already that the expression at Ephesus is not in the best manuscript. The expression at Ephesus is not in the best manuscript. So that's why I do believe that the letter was meant to be circulated, encyclical letter or epistles. And the faithful, when he says the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ, the faithful is the believers. The faithful is the believers. The two terms faithful and believers, brothers and sisters, are synonymous here. So you are the faithful. That's the believers. Faithful in having belief, in a sense. And when he says, in Christ Jesus, circle that emphatically in your notes, in Christ Jesus, that's what we call positional truth, which is very much positional, positional truth, okay? That's your position in Christ. This is your position in Christ. Christ in you and us in him. That's positional. And I repeat that the blank here, the fact that in, in some manuscripts you have the great, uh, you have to the saints who are at Ephesus, it's, it's in some manuscripts it reads to the saints, blank, who are faithful in Christ. And the reason why there would be a blank there, it's to put the name of a church where the epistle would be read here, and it makes sense. This is a style of writing that goes back to the Hellenistic period. Okay? When I say Hellenistic, it's the Greek period of time. The Hellenistic time, it's under the Greek Empire type of thing. Okay? Herod the Great, not Herod the Great, but uh, Alexander the Great type of thing. Okay? That's the Hellenistic period. And these documents of leaving a blank there goes back to the period of time of the Hellenistic time, empire, and it shows basically the letter would be meant to be circulated around letters and so on. In verse 2, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, circle grace and peace. Genuine grace and genuine peace have its source in God, both the Father and the Son. A genuine grace, true grace, and the genuine peace that we need to embrace now more than ever before have its source 
in God the Father and in God the Son and of course the Spirit. Okay, so that's why he says grace to you and peace from God our Father. You have the same thing in chapter 3 verse 2 where it says, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, that's all I want. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, it's called the grace of Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6, it's called the grace of Christ. There is no difference, it's the same. And in Colossians chapter 3 verse 15, you have the expression, the peace of Christ. Which is the same as the peace of God, because Christ is God. Okay? Keep in mind also one thing that is not on my note, that Christianity proper, biblical Christianism, is the only faith based on grace alone. In any other religion system, Islam, Roman Catholicism, you need to do deeds to be saved. But in our faith, it's all by grace. Grace, not grace, but grace by means of salvation. We do good deeds here, but never in order to be saved. Don't miss the message of tomorrow morning. At this point, you can tick mark on your outline, Roman numeral one, greetings, it's behind us and it's finished. You can tick mark that. Now we embark into a very lengthy section, Roman numeral two on your outlines. There is nothing on the slide today. The position of believers, which will cover from chapter 1, verse 3, to chapter 3, verse 21 on your outlines, if you don't note what I say right now. And it's subdivided in capital A, B, C, and D. All right, before we embark this right now, I would like to make for you four observations. An observation in when you study the book, you draw some conclusions and observation. I would like to give you four of them. Forgive me, I don't have tracks today, not tracks, but slide on the TV. This is just an old one. Basically, I should simply do that and it would be just much better. That's it, okay? I would like to make four observations before moving on and they are important. Number one, I will repeat everything two, twice or maybe three times. In this section of the book, Roman numeral 2, there is no word of exhortation from Paul. In this sex section of the book, Roman numeral 2, room numeral 2 on your outlines, there is no exhortation from Paul as to do what they lead, what they're walk in the daily lives. There is no exhortation as to how to walk the Christian life. And there is no exhortation about the service that we should give to God. There is no exhortation of that kind. There is no exhortation concerning how to walk the Christian walk and how to worship to make a shorter sentence. The second exhortation is characterized, the section, this section is characterized by the revelation, by the revelation of the bondless work of God in our behalf. You want to know this. This section of the book Roman numeral 2 is characterized by the revelation of the boundless, unlimited work of God 
on behalf of the one who trusts Christ. It's beautiful. Bondless, that is, doesn't have any bonds. It's immense, beyond our comprehension. What Christ, what God the Father did to us through Christ, the second person. This is the second observation of it all. The limitless love bestowed upon us. The third observation here is that under the law, under the Mosaic law, under the Mosaic law, the motif was obey and I will bless you. Obey and I will bless you. When you say that, obey and I will bless you, it makes it quite conditional. Meaning, I need to obey in order to be blessed. But in this section, the motif is different. And you need to make a note with me. In this section, the motif is different. The motif here goes, Obey, because I have already blessed you. It's even more powerful. Obey, François, because I have already bestowed unto you all the blessings in the heavenly places. Therefore, that's why we should obey. And that motif of obey, obey because I have already blessed you is way more in line with the position that we are in Christ. And this is something so dear to me that I would like you to repeat it to yourself. Why should I obey Christ Jesus and obey the commandments of the Messiah in the law of Christ? The reason is not to be blessed. Accident occurs to the most godly person. We have living example here. A stroke can happen to a godly person. Is, is, he, is it because he or she disobeyed? No. Here. These two people suffering these things as much as Jonathan, they, they, they're not disciplined or they don't suffer things because of disobedience here. Because these people have been bestowed all the blessings in the heavenly places. And that is in line with our position in Christ. And while we are in Christ in this planet, we do suffer. We have trials and tribulations. Unavoidable. Okay? So keep that in mind because these truths of the Bible here, they need to be taught to future generations. And it's hard for a parent because I, I get caught into it. Obey and I will buy ice cream. If you're good today with the people in class at the end, of, daddy will buy ice cream. It's not necessarily the best. Okay? It's obey, Sophia, because when you were born at one month old, daddy and mama was changing the diaper already. Say it's obey because you have been already blessed. But too young to understand these things. But in the faith, it is crucial simply because by means of understanding these things, we suffer less pressure, pressure in our Christian walk. And you get less burden in serving, in being a deacon in the church, in service in the church, in singing in the church. If you miss, if you stumble, you don't lose anything. Because you do these things because you have already been blessed. But if you do this in order to be blessed, you get worn out. Because your position in Christ is already full, completed. Nothing can be subtracted and nothing can be added to it. Number four. Satan's goal. Number four goes with number three. Satan likes to confuse the weak believer, I mean by this, the immature believer, 
at the crucial point by laying upon his conscience the responsibility of his walk by laying upon his conscience the responsibility of his walk before he can get the conception of his standing in Christ before he can get the conception of understanding his standing in Christ if he can keep you amused and busy with praying in tongues seeking prophecy conferences you're right in the smack of the will of Satan outside the will of God it's very more important to discover your standing in Christ than to pray in tongues and to assist a prophecy conference today. And he will try, try to keep you busy with dolls and legal blocks type of thing instead of getting in the meat where you come to a point and say, hey, I know where I'm standing, I know my purposes, and I know my limitations. I am in the Messiah, I am immo immovable. Okay? Satan will never be able to take your salvation away. It's impossible. It's an issue of ownership. You are owned now. You don't own yourself. We are owned by Christ. Christ is the owner. That's the meaning of his word, uh, capital L, lowercase o-r-d. It's Adonai. Adonai. It's Adonai. It means master and owner. He owns me. And Satan cannot buy me back. But if Satan can keep me immature, which he can do, he will. Now we move on into the exposition. That was the four observation for you to make. I would like you to have a good idea of what you're doing right now and the importance of that. It's very important. So now we move on into capital, not capital, Roman numeral 2. The position of the believers here, a chosen and sealed, and so on. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, circle blessed us, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, circle heavenly places, circle ten times the word in, I in, Christ. Now we're getting into the meat of the letter. And what we need to do in getting in the meat of the scripture here is to scrutinize the most exalted abiding position. Scrutinizing the most exalted abiding position to which any created being could ever be brought. The most abiding position to which any created being could ever be brought. It's higher than the angels. No animal, no angels can be told to stand in Christ. It's a very highly exalted position and that is your position it's called the doctrine of being like this in Christ that's your position no need to pray to get it no need to fast to get it no need to donate. Yeah, you need to donate, but you need to donate your life to get it. That's the very necessary first step for a child of God that you are perfect in the righteousness of God. You stand perfect in the righteousness of of God and of Christ imparted to you. 
nothing can be added. You don't need brownie points. You don't need rewards of any kind in this world. God is seeing you right now as being perfect. Why? Because of the righteousness of Christ imparted to you. Verse 3a, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We stop there. Blessed in Hebrew is Baraka. That's blessed in Hebrew, Baraka. It's a word very familiar to Paul because it's seen in the Old Testament. Psalm 66, verse 20. Psalm 41, verse 13. Psalm 72, verse 18. Second Corinthians chapter one verses three to four and first Peter chapter one verse three. I repeat Blessed is Baraka K H A H at the end. It's a concept not only of the New Testament but a concept of the Old Testament. It's fa familiar to Paul, just conspicuous example of Psalm 66, 20. Second Corinthians chapter one verses three to four and first Peter chapter one verse three. You want to make a note of this God is not only the source of all blessings, but he is also the object. of all worship, praise, and thanksgiving. He is not only the source of all blessings, but he is the only one deserving worship, praise, and thanks. I want you to note something as we read again. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the Father of Christ in a very unique way. So the contemplation should not stop with the Son. Ay, ay, ay. The contemp contemplation should not stop with the Son alone. But as we contemplate the Son, it should lead on to the Father. It's to the glory of God the Father. Matthew 11.27. I'm going to read it for you. Matthew 11.27 reads like this. This is the word of Christ. This is Jesus speaking as the God name. All things have been entered over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. So as we contemplate the study of the life of Christ, it should lead on to a deeper knowledge of the Father. All right? Hebrews chapter 1. 
The book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, reads like this. God, after we spoke long ago to the fathers, in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, basically in the messianic time, has spoken to us in son or in his son, whom he, appoint, whom he appointed heirs of all things, through whom also he made the word, the world. So basically, our worship of the Son should lead us to a closer relationship with the Father. One last one would be John 14.13. not going to ask you to turn, just start it out. John 14.13 says, Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So that's why the glory has to be to, go to God the Father. Okay? It's a sign of maturity. One can show immaturity if the Son has not led unto the knowledge of the Father. You can make a, do a note of this because this is the truth. One can show immaturity if the Son did not lead us to the knowledge of the Father. It's very important to make a, a short story for you. When I was young in the faith, I went to a Bible school. I don't need to say the name. And they claim to be Christ-centered, and they are. But it can, it can keep to a level of maturity, sometime of immaturity, where everything is centered around the Son, if you don't have a deeper relationship with the Father. And that doesn't lead one to maturity. It's very important that we develop that crisis was there, those who have seen me have seen the Father. And the Abba relationship that we have is with God the Father through Christ. So this is not for nothing that a proper prayer starts with Heavenly Father, Father of grace, Father in heaven, my Father. Then you go with your Walmart or whatever list it could be and you finish your prayer in Jesus' name. That's the proper format. The reason why we finish the prayer in Jesus' name is because we pray in His authority, but the addressee of the prayer ought to be the Father. Because Christ Jesus, you will never see Him praying in His humanity, addressing the prayer to Himself. He never said one time in this all time of ministry, Lord Jesus... I'm asking you to provide food in the desert. Never. He never prayed to himself. And he leave us an example to follow with the proper procedures of the proper subordination and to have a deep relationship with God through Christ. So that's why any pro-charismatic movement today that is centered around the Spirit being slain in the Spirit, being controlled and praying in tongues and uh, following the Spirit is absolutely not biblical if it does not give the glory to Christ and the Father. You cannot center around the Holy Spirit if it does not disclose the things of Christ and so on. That's what it says in the book of John sixteen fourteen. I'm taking one, one by verse because one, one verse at a time showing you John 16, 14 because it says this and that concerning what I just said here. Talking about the Holy Spirit, Christ says this. Remember this. He will glorify me. The he here is the third person of the triune God, the Spirit. Because it, that's what it says in verse 13. When he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. 
because he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatsoever he hears, he will speak. That's the Spirit. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. So he will glorify me. So if your movement is centered on the spirit, off mark, completely. Not even close, completely. The Holy Spirit would glorify God. This is important if you go back to Ephesians, because it says grace to you and peace from God our Father. Uh, verse 3, rather. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Who has blessed you? The Father, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, where? In my Son, or in Christ. And that gives you a better understanding of the triune God. And if you look at this, that's why we decipher only almost word by word what's going on here. It's because of the Father places you in a position in His Son, and therefore you're blessed through Him. Nobody's diminished. And who is the person of the triune God that is telling you, if He's telling you right now, that you are hearing the truth? It's not me. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So the triune God is doing His work. This is deeper than Bible school, what we're learning right now. So that's basically what it is. Before the break, we take one more sentence. With every spiritual blessings, this position here or in the heavenlies has blessed us with every, so you circle right now, every spiritual blessing. That's all I want for now. It's found five times in Ephesians. I'll give you the places where you find it. In the book of Ephesians. Chapter 1 verse 3. Right here. Verse 20. Of chapter 1. Chapter 2 verse 6. Chapter 3 verse 10. And chapter 6, verse 12, I repeat. 1, 3, right here, in verse 3. Chapter 1, verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 10. And chapter 6, verse 12. That's the expression that goes with the heavenlies, plural. Or you can also write in your notes, in the heavenly realm. In the heavenlies or in the heavenly, heavenly realm. Here the emphasis is on the spiritual blessing. Not the fridge full or half empty. The emphasis here is on the spiritual blessings, not necessarily the material blessing. Okay? Because when you talk about material blessing, it's bestowed on, bestowed on mankind. Be with me for a moment. Okay? When you drive here into the Vancouver Island, north or south here, you have farmers on the left and the right with cows and sheep and so on. And the sun is shining right now, making the produce growing for both believers and unbelievers alike. Okay? So that's what we call the divine providence of God. You have an unbelieving person swearing all the time that has 100 sheep, they eat, uh, they produce, they multiply, as well as the Christian. But here, it's the heavenly places, all the blessings that you have received, it is not bestowed upon the unbelievers yet. And perhaps will never be. Because not everybody will be saved. It's exclusive to you. It is exclusive pertaining to you. An unbeliever does not have this. Simple, simple, because an unbeliever is not in Christ. 
For 33 years, I was outside of Christ, not having this bestowed upon me. Okay? So what are these blessings and where they are? As far as where they are, they are in Christ. I'm going to answer what are these blessings. That's the content of the book. That's what we will see. But where they are, they are in Christ because of the union that we have with him. We are united. We're bound to him. You're, we are united with him. We were co-crucified, co-die, and co-resurrected with him. So we have a position with him. That's where they are. Number two, where is Christ right now as we speak as a resurrected man? Where is he now? If you answer in me, it's not necessarily proper because I did ask you with pay close attention to the wording. Where is Christ physically as a resurrected person? He is in heaven and you are in Christ and Christ is in you. So these blessings are heavenlies. Okay, that's the sphere of operation. Okay, this is the heavenlies, H, and this is the earth. And this is me on the earth right now. I'm going to give myself a smile. I feel good today. Okay, so that's the sphere. But Christ is re resurrected right here with a glorified body. So let's make him shiny a little bit type of thing. And here I am on earth, but I have a spiritual position. Although I'm on earth here with all the trials and tribulations that we go through together, I have an heavenly position because I am in him and him is in me. So the sphere of operation of all the spiritual blessings that I have is heavenly. Sophia would understand this. She would in the three years, three, four years. Okay, that's what we need to be taught. Thirdly, we share a common life through faith in Christ. We share a common life through faith in Christ. You've never seen him. You believe this by faith. And we have a heavenly citizenship. And we have a heavenly citizenship. Make a note. Second Peter. Second Peter one four. Second Peter one four. Listen to this. For by these he, God, has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you have become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So you have become partakers of the divine nature because you are in Christ and Christ is in you. You never became God. But you partook in him and he is glorified and he is God. I'm surprised that I don't hear an amen. It's because you are thinking and it's beautiful. I prefer thinking than amen. And you believe this? Answer me now. Yes. You do? Are you sure? Great. This is your position. There are days when you don't. <laughs> I appreciate your honesty a lot. Yeah. Call it doubters. Yeah. Who, who was one of the doubters? His name is uh, John something, and he was the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. What's his name again? John? Uh, is he the one? Go ask him if we should look for another, uh, somebody else. You don't remember that passage, eh? He's in prison. Uh, Joan, would you ask him if we should look for somebody else? Where's that question arising? The OBT. Should we look for somebody else? And he answers the, 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 the sender. Go tell John that the, the, the eyes of the blind are open and this and that and this and that. So meaning, stop doubting, John. I'm the one. So what he says, what she says is absolutely true. But to be reminded and to be anchored in it as we do Ephesians type of thing. The construction, I'm not English. She's good English. 
we have been blessed with all the heavenly, uh, all the blessings in the heavenly places. I'm not sure, but have been blessed. Uh, ed at the end, it makes it kind of an adjective. Have been, it's a past tense construction. It's not, and you will be blessed if you obey. It's a past tense construction. When did it occur? At salvation. Not because you've been baptized, and not because you do good, and not because you have the desire to walk the walk. At salvation, you were showered with all this. This is your position, never taken away. And that's why I said to you, there is doubt. I appreciate that. But these will fade away as we study these things, because when is doubt is the other one knocking. Do you truly believe that, Ernie? It's also, not coming from him. There is also doubting Thomas. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Doubt, it's, it's a lack of knowledge. You will doubt again, but you will doubt less, less and less, because we are together growing to maturity. I doubt, Father, I have a doubt right now because of my weaknesses. I'm too limited for your goodness. But I know my position. You will say, yeah, I know you doubt. But you will doubt less and less because you are anchored more and more. That's what we need to do today. Doubting is perfectly normal when you pass the door and you get in your car in the parking lot. Wherever you go, why not doubts would kick in? Why not? It's a life of uncertainty. You have been in uncertainty for the last 60 some years. The day that you were born, you prone yourself to die. It's the beginning of the end. Because that body cannot be seen. Coffee and water for me.